In a moment, discover why ravens in London are given royal treatment. In his famous poem, The Raven, Edgar Allan Poe created a memorable phrase, quote the raven, nevermore. In England, however, a more appropriate phrase for ravens would be, evermore. The ancient Tower of London provides a home for six English ravens who bear a heavy responsibility. The ravens are very well treated, but their wings are clipped, so they cannot fly. Tradition insists that if they ever leave the tower, England will fall. The ravens are supported by the British government. They are fed and looked after by the Tower of London's Yeoman Warders. For the birds at least, this is a permanent assignment. When they die, the birds will be replaced, but their remains are buried in this historic ground which is one more way of ensuring that ravens will remain forever. So there will always be an England and a job for the yeoman warders. Early in the course, they face a chilling test of nerves called the Land's End Long Jump. To prove how confident I am, I won't use any harness. All right, just to show you how easy it is. But for you, because you're students, be roped on. Okay. It's a risky 10-foot jump, and failure would mean a lethal fall of nearly 300 feet. And that's all there is to it. Aim to get your feet on about this pancake here, and you'll, you'll get on it quite easily. All right, any questions? How long you be late here? If a trainee does not jump, he will be dismissed from the program. To stay in, he must conquer fear. Smaller coils than that. Aye, aye. Go on, don't hang about. The longer you hang about, the harder it'll be. As soon as you're ready, just go. Go on, go for it. Go on. Most and prefer the whole omelet. Right. Everyone have a good old uh, chomp in them. Move to up against the wall. Move till your faces are up against the wall. On a remote island off the coast of Scotland, the trainees must adjust to the unexpected. They don't know why they must sit or for how long. And that is the point of this exercise, to learn to endure uncertainty. This is the beginning of an exercise teaching survival behind enemy lines. The men will have to live off the land. Take all your clothes off except for your necks. Don't let me catch you talking to the locals. They will be allowed to carry only a small tobacco can holding matches, a fishing line and hooks, a jackknife, one razor blade, and nothing else. The clothing they are given is 40-year-old World War II surplus, none of it waterproof. Their instructors are not going with them. The trainees will be on their own. To build a shelter, 
they must use whatever materials they can find. A surprise visit by an instructor means criticism, correction, and a search to ensure the men don't have any unauthorized supplies. To prepare the men for fighting in extreme cold, their conditioning continues in central Norway. We are truly grateful. We are truly grateful. In field exercises, the trainees must put their survival skills to the test. Water this cold could kill a man in a few moments. Getting out, however, is only half the battle. Getting warm is another problem, solved by going for a run. For their final exercise, the men will trek across 200 miles of desolate Arctic terrain, enduring temperatures of 50 degrees below zero. They must rendezvous with a helicopter they think will take them back to base. Training for war, however, means training for surprise. As the men are about to learn, the helicopter carries a mock enemy force. Reacting instinctively, the trainees fight back. The struggle is fierce and, for a moment, takes on the brutal aspects of actual combat. The trainees lose the battle but pass the test. Return to barracks, their training over, the men still do not know if they have made it into the elite unit. I'm Paul Craig, stand easy and stand easy. We've got your final course report, a likeable man who should be an asset to the branch. Congratulations. After 11 months of training, each man has finally earned the title Mountain Leader. Back when photography was just beginning to be a big business, cameramen had to learn to look at the world upside down. This is a Deardorf portrait camera a type that's been in use for over half a century. To focus and compose a picture, the photographer would work with a lens that made the object appear upside down. Today, of course, we have reflex cameras that turn things right side up. So that what you see is what you get. Well, almost. When photographer Roger Williams took this picture, he was sure he had a prize winner. He was right. He submitted it to two contests and won two second place prizes. Then he submitted it to three more contests, upside down, and won three more prizes. This time though, he didn't come in second. In all three cases, the upside down photo came in first. Which goes to show that being a winner often simply depends on how you look at things.
This spectacular view of outer space, a moment of perfect planetary alignment, never occurred. It's a photographic illusion. These portraits of space were taken inside a small workshop by a man who has never looked through a telescope. He's a Japanese photographer named Satoru Agura, and he shops in ordinary grocery stores for the materials he turns into blazing stars and mysterious planets. <laughs> Agura is a photographic artist with a mystic approach to his work. He focuses his concentration with prayer and lessons from the life of Buddha. To create his spectacular images of the universe, he first seeks an inner vision of them. A quick sketch captures his concept in rough detail. By packing mud on a toy globe, Agura begins the creation of a remote moon circling a distant planet. Agura has assembled a collection of small stones for making craters of different sizes. Although it may seem improbable, with skillful lighting and careful framing, the toy globe becomes a desolate, pockmarked moon. Then, the photograph of the moon is superimposed onto another picture, and the illusion is complete. With a hot plate and a tea kettle, Agura creates one of the huge clouds of gas that float through space. A filter provides the color. Where most men see nothing more than rice, Agura finds inspiration for another of what he calls the countless unfolding dramas of space. A glowing rice comet is superimposed on a real photograph of the sun. To a guru's eye, a breakfast bun can contain a universe. When his pictures are finished, he wants them to make people feel as though they're floating within the depths of space itself. In an Agura photograph, a splash of cream becomes a swirling galaxy. Another remarkable example of how commonplace objects can be transformed into works of art. In Milan, Italy, photography is being used to help recover a priceless work of art from the past. 500 years ago, in the church of Santa Maria della Grazia, Leonardo da Vinci painted The Last Supper. The work was a masterpiece, but da Vinci had made a tragic mistake. As an experiment, he used a new material to coat the wall before he painted. As a result of his error, the masterpiece soon began to peel and crack. During the Second World War, the wall itself was threatened with abrupt destruction. It was hoped sandbags would protect it from bombing raids. The church was hit, but the sandbags and a covering sheet saved what remained of the Last Supper. It had been changed by past restoration efforts that included repainting parts of it. 
Today, art expert Panin Brambila removes the layers of paint left by past restoration attempts. Sometimes, the result is the discovery that a portion of the original has vanished. As part of her work to reclaim the original, Dr. Brambila must clean the surface millimeter by millimeter. Her exacting task has already taken eight years. She cannot predict when she'll be finished. The colors have faded, but each line and shape in the cleaned section is now exactly as da Vinci painted it. The untouched patches serve as reference points, documenting the precise effect of the restoration. The progress to date is recorded by a Polaroid camera specially designed for photographing art masterpieces. Bring it up to about this level. Okay. The camera produces a 20 by 24 inch positive, which is exactly the size of the section photographed. Because the pictures are produced quickly and without being sent to a lab, they can be checked immediately for color accuracy. Let's check the exposure with the painting. The colors are not quite right. If the photograph is too red, the error can be corrected with a yellow filter. The end result is a perfect reproduction of the original. When all the photographs have been taken, they'll constitute the best possible copy of the great work. Because of its delicate state, very few people are allowed to approach the mural itself. The photographs, however, can be closely studied by countless art lovers here and in galleries throughout the world. And someday, in part because of these photographs, experts might be able to restore the Last Supper to its original glory, despite the ravages of time. Next on Ripley's Believe It or Not, discover how doctors use hypnosis to help their patients become immune to pain. Cling to a cliff with climbers willing to risk their lives to test their courage. Make a house call with a professional snake charmer in Egypt. Take a leap from the top of the world's highest waterfall. Next on Ripley's Believe It or Not. This is David Hartman. It's one of Broadway's most successful shows. Now it's coming to the screen all next week. The making of the movie, A Chorus Line. Also Jackie Gleason, John Boyd, and Bob Geldof. Next week on Good Morning America. Wednesday at 8, a rock and roll murder has the insiders investigating the world of music with a song of revenge. And then will a carefully laid plan be exposed? And will Crystal's terror finally end? Watch Dynasty, followed by Hotel.